as the elf and the antler faded from view, and everyone and everything resumed in motion none the wiser to the interaction that had just occurred. Two men, sharing a meal at a cafe two miles down the road, looked away from the scene and continued their conversation. He is a quick one, one of the men, a praetor, spoke. Think he's heading for the Draxus to find me next? His companion, Tag alone, merely shook his head. No, he has his answer. He knows better than to expect to get answers directly from any of the Nine Wings chosen, or their servants. He knows which of the three is now behind things, and he will begin to extrapolate the reasons as to the why and do what he can to assist in that way that his line is always doing. You seem annoyed. Are you worried that he will figure out the reasons for the hands being called before you do? Tag's flesh flashed with annoyance for but a moment. Easy there. I am his damned knight and I am flying just as blind as the two of you are to the greater shape of his design. That's what bothers me. I can get your boss not sharing with me. Old blood and old feuds. Tag held his hand up to forestall the response. But to not clue you into things? That only has a few reasonable explanations, and none of those are especially enjoyable to contemplate. Then don't. We both have duties that we need to perform. The Praetor stood. I am due back in but a few hours. Wouldn't do to disrupt what is in motion. How goes that avenue? Tag did not know what role the Praetor was playing in the efforts of his lord and bonded the Claw of the Nine Wings. But he knew that his efforts, that there were at least two separate sets of hands in play, and as far as Tag knew, that was a first, unless it wasn't. Better than expected, they are bright and gifted, and know how to seize opportunity and pass on egotism for the greater mission. I am impressed. He looked at Tag, as if he had just had a similar thought to Tag's own. No, Tag, I don't know. The boss made the picks, not me. But your logic is sound. So you don't know if one of our groups is a ruse, or you don't know which one. Tag knew the answer, even before it came from the Praetor's lips. Yes, and with that, he faded away. As my companion and I stood on the outermost edge of the grove, we took in the sights, sounds, and smells of this hallowed and sacred glade. Priests and clerics of both Roth and of Her Majesty Genevieve moved about. Guiding pilgrims were speaking to them of the history and meaning of this place. Only a few buildings stood, all grown from the ground up, via the magics of the divine guardians and tenders of this place. A lodge and eatery, a few temples, housing for the few that lived here on any sort of long-term basis, and the Hall of Honor and Memory. One in the nine sights, where one must contemplate the nine failures, make the nine prayers of contrition, and attain the nine affirmations, all to gain back a gift that was stolen generations ago. The big guy doesn't forgive easy, does he? The man beside me, nearly as tall as I was in my shortened form, spoke wryly. 
Looking about to make sure none were close enough to overhear, he continued. I know you've walked the path, Tag. My question is, why? The last I saw of you was after the loss of the Isle, and you still had your grace. Why would you need to have walked the path if... He didn't know. By the nine and four, he didn't know. Setson, that was before I was sentenced to be committed to the void. The silence in response would have been one thing, and totally natural. But Sensen went still, as if no thing or force could move him for the long moment as he processed the statement. Even once he had, he was not sure he had heard it correctly, or more accurately, he hoped he had not. Commit? That's... There's only one who... He looked at me with a hard look. The Lord Protector? I could only nod. He took... He took your... Cut, sealed, and burned away. All this time later, my wings still twitched at the memory, and a forgotten flash of pain rippled along where they had been cleaved from my back. Then, then how did you, how did you survive? A piece of pure voice that strapped to your chest, powered by... You would have to deal with an ever-increasing amount of entropic void cascading over your body. No analog has made it for more than a week before being consumed utterly. Nine days is the official record, I spoke. Oh, so you, so you never actually... His voice held the hope that it felt monstrous for me to crush. But the truth was the truth. No, I was, and I stayed, in the pit, with that thing strapped to my chest. It was more than pain, and less than agony. By the time I was discovered and freed, the device hadn't been able to do more than superficial damage for quite some time. But how? How, Tag? His voice was soft and confused. A rarity for him. Sithen, I am a master of the true fist and of the erratic arts. My erratic specialty is in regeneration. <laughs> I developed it over the time I was in the pit and mastered it. I was able to combine the training of the true fist and the power it allows me to tap into to fuel my aura. And my aura fueled my healing. The restoration of my mass lost to the void essa and the void energies it released. To be fair, I don't know how I managed it beyond the mechanics I used. From my perspective, I was lost in deep meditation and focus trying to hold back the destruction and sublimation of my body. I had no time to track, <laughs> well, time. But before you ask, the best guess is somewhere between nine and 10. Centuries. His voice was soft and his look was that of horror as he knew my answer. Millennia on the low end. I took a slow breath before continuing, trying to shift the topic. I come to these places and walk the path to remember why it is I endured all that. My people are meant to be the paragons and sage guides of the realms, and these places are a testament to that purpose. To walk the path allows me to be in touch with that greater purpose. He looked to the center of the glade, to the great tree of Roth, towering hundreds of feet beyond even the tall canopy of the wider forest. Tag, why do I feel that there should be some great building or such where that tree is? <laughs> Very impressive, Setson. Only a few have the senses needed to perceive the echo of what was once there. It was the Arcanum Archive of the Dakwa. 
renamed the Temple of Ro after the first defeat of Vanson by the heroes. He nodded for me to continue. It's where most, if not all, the major battles with Vanson took place, as the gate used to originally summon him and then to bind and seal him was all part of this structure's design and apparently its very purpose. At some point after the beginning of the Age of Valor, it was removed by the bees and the healing of the swamps began. By the end of the Age of Valor, Roth had implanted himself in the crater and becoming what we see here. His calm and pure nature of, well, <laughs> nature, along with the efforts of Her Majesty's divine servants are what turned this place back into the great woods we once knew it as. He took it all in. I figured he knew most of it already, and he was just as eager as I to leave the previous topic behind. So why am I here then? You're the one who called me. His voice had a soft tint of annoyance. I handed him an envelope. That has all the details and everything I know about where you should be going and what you should be looking out for. He took the envelope and opened it, quickly read the contents and looked at me while he stowed it away in a pocket in his vest. I wasn't aware you were now in the business of playing fixer. I am not a fixer. You know how little I enjoy these things. But when the revered call, a quick nod told me and now understood the situation. Well, that says it all. If you don't have anything else, I'll be off so you can have your peace here. No sarcasm, no wit, just an honest query. No, thank you, Setson. Please be safe. Crater's Drag is not a... Who am I kidding? You'll fit right in with the rascals and ne'er-do-wells of that place. I smiled wide, as Setson was a gambler and ne'er-do-well extraordinaire himself, but one with an eye on the greater balance of things, and thus often found himself having to act to maintain it. Okay, I keep telling you, we could clean out Old Dominion in less than a week if... If you weren't persona non grata on the grounds and everywhere within 50 miles? I laughed. He'd been making jokes about trying to clean out the old Baylor's place for as long as I had known him in the recent ages. We had only known each other in passing in the old days. But it seemed that the impossibility of the task is what drew him to the idea. There, there is that. Oh well, maybe next time. He chuckled as he walked off leaving me to sit and begin to meditate. This ground was hollowed and blessed by the gods of men and elder, and I needed all the blessing and hallowed I could get, as it seemed that the prelude was now done, and the first act set to begin. I again looked at the coin I had gotten from Starwalker, and thought about again how for the price I paid, I could have gotten an entire capital class star vessel. Shaking my hand as I flipped the coin and let it activate, ripping a hole in reality but a few yards in front of me, I knew that I had most likely still come out ahead on the deal. Just as the portal had finished forming, I began to dash, my feet never touching the ground, instead staying about a foot above it as I ran through the portal and felt a shiver of its transit. Coming out on the other side and before the portal's energy had completely dissipated, everything around me began to shift and shake. As if you were watching a recording at, that had been paused, the image flickering back and forth between moments. The inkless step was one of the most feared, least understood, and most speculated on abilities within the realm among those that knew of it, of course. It allowed me to move and act completely outside the flow of and notice of time and reality for most practical purposes. And so far as I knew, I was only one of five to know the technique. As I continued my run, I saw the place I had come to visit 
a large dome made up of large reed-like plants grown into the shape of a grand greenhouse from all appearances, making for the only arched doorway and weaving between the few monks that seem to live here and tend the orchard within, I could see and feel the layers upon layers of magical and other obfuscation and concealment worked into the building and the wider grounds. Now I knew I had gotten a deal on the coin, and it was now clear to me why no one else seemed to know or would admit to knowing where this location was. There were great forces behind this place and keeping it as unknown and unfindable as possible. And with the bounty it held, I wondered if it was enough, as I ran in and launched into the air. Stopping when I reached a high central point above the trees, I spun and cast out my weights and the wires attached to them into differing sections of the grove and orchard beneath me each of them snaking into the trees and securing the prizes of my efforts. As I pulled the wires back and stowed the fruits that they carried into a pouch that would perfectly preserve them until they were needed, I landed and began to run back towards the night oh, bright arched opening, watching it grow bigger as I rapidly approached. Until it suddenly shrank in size and a burst of pain flowed across my face. As my broken nose reset and mended itself, I looked at a man, short even for a human, floating a few feet above the ground, between me and the exit. He wore robes and raiment that I knew well, and it explained how he just struck me as hard as he had. But, I guess I was mistaken. There were at least six who knew the step, apparently. He spoke, seeming to sense my thoughts. Did you think a prize such as the one you were trying to abscond with would not be under the protection of one at least capable of reacting to such incursions? Before I answered, he continued, Not that it matters. You now have two possible futures from this point, thief. Either you impress me and I allow you to leave, or you become compost for the grove. I would recommend the first line of action if I were you. He was already centered and allowing both his powers as a fist and as a student of the blue flame to flow like waves on a beach over his body. Calm, rhythmic, and serene. Looking at him, I knew he was at best a quarter to maybe a third as powerful as I was. So I did something I rarely allowed myself to do. I relaxed. And without the tight hold, my passive energies, they came bursting forth flowing out bright and strong to those with the ability to see it, easily dwarfing the smaller man's display. Despite this, he just sighed and narrowed his eyes as he spoke. Insulting me is not a good first move, Anilar. Perhaps this shall impress on you the nature of your situation. Then he called forth his full might. The secrets and powers that the way of the fist reveal and make available to one who masters the lesson required. His physical form only grew a slight bit. A subtle mark of mastery that was rare among the already rare disciples of the fist. And his aura and energies did not explode from him as mine had or was the norm. Instead, flowing around in a deep, dense-looking cocoon of flowing power that now dwarfed mine as I had dwarfed his. My thoughts were then disturbed by my own power and aura responding to the display of this stranger. I felt a power 
and a strength I had not allowed myself to know again in this age, return like an old lover, and it was bliss. That is until my arm shattered in nine places from my aura, and the regeneration that it maintained began spinning into full overdrive with the torrent of power I was now allowing to flow out of me. As more bones began to crack and break, I had to pull my focus entirely in on controlling this before I destroyed myself with my own power. I could feel it flowing like a great flare of a star and understood if I did not contain it, I would be burned out as surely as if it were the flames of an angry star. For a long, timeless moment, I pulled and shaped my power, how it was flowing, where it released. With a resounding pop, I felt all my wires split into multiples, and the bursts of raw power now focused on the striking weights, along which the lines connected and flowed, the wires moved around me in patterns woven in and out of vision and sense. In now smooth motions controlled fully by me once more. As my ability to focus on something outside of myself and the torment I had been suffering returned, I noted that the stranger's own power was still perhaps three quarters of mine now that I had tapped my full strength for the first time since before the wars. He merely smiled and shrank the minor bit back to normal, having released his own power. That'll do, was all he said before turning to walk back to where he had been when I had entered. Just before he returned to the normal flow of time, he spoke to me one last line, a warning. If you ever attempt to defile the sanctity of this place again, you will serve as fertilizer for the grove for the following nine ages of the realms. Do not doubt my sincerity on this. Tag alone. With that, he returned, shifting and phased into the normal time stream. And I, properly warned, left with all possible haste, as I knew this not to be an idle threat or bluff. I moved with speed and rapidity that my new form allowed, exiting the grove and streaking into the sky in a blur of power. I came back down to enter into the base we had chosen for our endeavor. I moved with haste along its mostly empty halls before finding myself outside the door to the conference room that Percival would be waiting for me within. Before ending this step and returning to time's flow and grip, I had the presence of mind to release my power and return to my normal form. As soon as I ended the step, I realized the folly of not having done so much earlier. Maintaining the step while using and expelling all that power had a cost. One that only made itself known when time once again was a reality for me. I stumbled forward into the door, the striking weights on my wrist acting as a door knocker. It slid to the side with no sound and I half walked, half stumbled into the room, still getting my feet back from under me. Upon seeing Percival and the guest he was speaking to, I went from half to full stumble and collapsed bodily at the edge of the table they were sitting at. I could feel the aches and pains from my little stunt raging at my body for the mere act of existing. Looks like you could use this. Percival's guest spoke as he handed me a small flask, and I happily took a small draft of the drink contained within. 
and found it to be the very juice of the fruit that was the cause of my current state. Feeling and tasting the sweet power of the juice that was in the flask, I felt my body's complaints dull, then vanish, and found myself able to move and stand normally. Moving to hand back the flask, I found that the guest was gone, with only the flask as proof of his presence. I looked at Percival. Do I even want to know how you know him? I was unsure if I actually wanted the answer to this one. We're old friends. He said he wanted to visit and catch up. Percival's tone made it clear that he was no more fooled by the reasoning than I would be. But when dealing with those of upper management, you took things as they were given and analyzed the whys and the hows later. Looking at the great door before me, I took a moment to ponder just how often anyone actually came this way. My uncle was a recluse, to put it bluntly, and I had not been to see him since my release from the pit, and I was unsure how this reunion was likely to play out. I had been standing there for a few minutes now, knowing that I should have made this journey long before now, and was now trying to collect my words. As the large portal opened, and the tunnel of elemental power beyond calmed from a torrent of destruction to a clear and safe passage, I accepted it was of little consequence, as he had knowledge that I was in dire need of. So I walked forward for some time before crossing another opening and finding myself in a workshop that I had not seen in ages. Its outer shape and dimensions were as I remembered them, but the configurations of shelves, benches, and other miscellary of my uncle's constant crafting and experimentation was far more dense and crowded than I remembered all neatly ordered in its place, yet there always seemed to be a half-completed project on each of the stations and benches I passed. Of course, in the center of the room, hunched over a machine of some kind, was my uncle. When he turned to greet me, I was stunned for a brief moment as I saw the fleshless form of his skull, and came to realize that he had, in fact, become a lich, and that the rumors were true on this matter. My Uncle Jackson seemed to understand my shock, but was not going to let the moment pass. Tagalon, son of my brother, eldest and law master of your house, I welcome you to my home. Please do not allow the changes of my unlife to give you pause. Tell me why you have come. What can this dusty pile of bones do for you? His wise smile made me chuckle. Uncle Jackson always had been different from most of his contemporaries in his humility. Simple, Uncle Jackson. I, I need to learn about Vanson. From someone who can tell me more than chaos and death made flesh or the like. For but being a skull, it was impressive how he, the distaste for the subject matter could be read from his face. I know you were not present during the rain, and understand why you might be curious, but both it and he are long dead and destroyed, and best left in the past. What is your interest in it? Purely academic, or...? He let the rest of the question hang, knowing that there may be more at play than could be discussed directly. Uncle, you are painfully aware how the past has a habit of finding its way back into the present, and I have reason to believe that there may be forces of work that are... 
I considered my words carefully, as Jackson didn't need to be dragged into the details. Heavily influenced by the long dead demon in their formation, and I was hoping insight into one would aid in the defeat of the other. Jackson looked at me with his empty eye sockets, and I could feel the scrutiny of his gaze roll over me for a moment before he spoke. Dag, I shall tell you, but you have to understand I did not leave this point at any point during the rain. My equipment was only partially reliable in gathering information. So pervasive was the demon's taint, so disruptive to the natural order his presence was. He motioned to a chair that was walking up to me. Please, take a seat. I'll brew us some tea. This is going to be a long discussion, and we are only having it once. Understood? I paced back and forth across the room, the flames of the fireplace distorting my form wildly into moving shadows on the wall opposite. The entire keep was quiet and dark, and that was part of the problem. Percival was supposed to have been back weeks ago, and I had not heard a word from Starwalker in months and had no clue as to their whereabouts or their situation. As I turned for another lap across the room, I felt it. The presence of another, one who was doing a remarkably good job of concealing themselves in their entrance, but not quite good enough to get past me. I turned and fully focused my attention at the presence and saw only a large, shadowy, billowing form with flaming eyes of violet, the only steady thing. Greetings, Tagalon. The shadow spoke. The situation has evolved. I am now taking point on this endeavor. I've heard of this man, of course, and if he were here, and furthermore was not lying, things were dire indeed. Evolved how, and who involved you? I could practically feel a slight grin split his face. Mischief and defiance. A grin I knew all too well. Nywee got played badly, very badly, and thus is no longer fit to manage the situation. I was charged with this duty by decree of the hand. The shadow paused, seeming to sense my wariness. Starwalker is currently recovering from suffering revocation. The word resounded with a thunderous echo, or seemed to by the very weight of their meaning. Revocation? For what? Refusing to attack a divine that was interfering in his patron's Affairs. Ooh. Her Majesty. The words hung there for a long moment as I processed. He lives, though? Yes. Yes, he lives. Praetors are rather robust creatures, after all. He's being tended by one most qualified for the task, if he wishes to return to the fight afterwards, is another matter altogether. Not a concern for now then, if you are now running things, what's the plan? 
I didn't want to consider that this may have broken the prey door. Mostly because I doubted that was even a possibility. We spent the next few hours conversing and sharing the information we both had and rearranging our plans as was needed. I was informed about the other group of interest, aside from Han and his unit. They were based in Solaris and were looking at a war with another local lord. However, if not for the unusual amount of hardware this deep lock had apparently ordered for the conflict, it appeared to be just like any number of similar scenarios that play out across the realms in non-sovereign territories with regularity. And even that was easily explained away by deep lock simply have saved for some time for this acquisition, as they were a long time feature of that part of Solaris and presumably would have the coffers to afford such an expensive properly planned for. All except for the disappearance of the boy, Cathian. That is what showed there were other interests in play, and powerful ones at that. Ones that should not have any interest in such a minor local dispute. By simple logic, his extraction would have required a very high-end agent to pull off, in the manner that it was. No traces left behind by the assailant, and no clues as to exactly how or when it had happened. Farmhold was advanced for the way it liberally employed various Chris tech and other security measures, and had quite the assortment of other tech and magics to make sure those measures were surprisingly effective. Layered as they were, with such a very yet strangely complementary array of both normal tech and advanced magic from multiple cultures, the walls and city of Farmhold were as protected as well or better than some of the capitals of other council sitting nations. Short of the gods, from Grand Analar, or the equivalent, the place should have been nigh impregnable, at least for such an extraction to be done the way it apparently had been. I idly wondered if even Han and his crew could have pulled it off. We need to find the boy. The shadow continued, perhaps picking up on my thoughts. Perhaps your sergeant could... No, I looked at him. He needs to stay with his factory system. We cannot allow that to be left unsecured. There is an unknown provocateur trying their best to pull them away just long enough for it to be recaptured. My guess is the Empire wanting it back for themselves. The eyes blinked for the first time in our meeting. Very well. What then is your suggestion? I turned to smile. I know a team that can take care of this. The Brothers Caliber. They also happen to owe me a favor. The eyes were still steady but I could almost see the line of a smile in dark folds of that shadow. That grin again. I foresaw trouble working with this man, for he was likely to embolden bad habits that I really shouldn't indulge in. Very well, they will do. Make the arrangements. I will see about freeing up your sergeant. We will have need of him and his team. And I am afraid it will be sooner than either of us is hoping. I looked at the man sitting before me in his white suit and waited for his reply to my request for the brother's service. Well, I wasn't in the mood to wait. 
What's the nature of the job? He eyed me very carefully. Asset location and recovery. A man was kidnapped a few months ago. His eyes softened, but didn't lose their focus in the least. You are sure he lives? I wouldn't waste your time otherwise. The man pulled a small book from his inner pocket, lifted a pen from a hollow in the spine, and prepared to write. This will settle your debt in full, you understand. Of, of course. Alright. Name of the target? Captain. Lord of Farmhold. The man paused, pen hovering perfectly still for a moment, before he closed the book and stowed it away with the pen. Looking up at me with a hard look, he, he simply stated, The brother's caliber are on it. No fees charged or favors spent. Now go, and know this task will be handled with precision and alacrity. You will be contacted when they have completed their work. As I left, I felt the anger of the tragedy of avarice flare white and hot for just a moment before being dampened by the closing door behind me. Interesting. What was his interest in the boy? They are completely oblivious to the fact that by the actions of Tagalon, one of the most skilled and potent mercenary teams in the realms, the Brothers Caliber, were even now on their way to begin investigating and seeking out the location of that last lord. Furthermore, Tag's new boss has made his intent to reinforce Sarge and his unit clear, and no doubt has begun to recruit men, women, and materiel to have ready for when Sarge and his unit inevitably go looking for those very things. The news of Star Walker being out of commission has disturbed Tag greatly, and he is throwing himself into whatever tasks he can to avoid overly thinking on the matter. Percival has still not been seen or located, however a message from him confirmed his living at least, and that he was investigating a possible Leftover from the wars of feather and scale, with no clear description beyond that. All in all, Tag sees this first act close on a low but rising note. If you'd like to contribute to the further exploration and explanation of the realms, please consider leaving a comment, a like, and sharing the video around. I read all the comments and make efforts to reply to each. Thank you for helping to grow the channel and know I look forward to each and every one of your comments. Other methods of support can be found in the channel's description. Thank you for watching.